Welcome to the Fish House Nation podcast. We're in St. Paul at the St. Paul Ice Fishing Show, and we're joined this time by Troy, Mr. Bluegill Peterson. Troy, thanks for joining the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, and you're Mr. Bluegill, so we're going to talk bluegills today. That's awesome. You like to chase lots of other fish, but since you got the Mr. Bluegill shirt on, we're going to talk bluegills. And what is it about bluegills that turns you on? What's your thing with them? Um, yeah. You know, number one is just the absolute pound for pound. I think they're one of the most fighting fish that swim in all of North America. Um, I mean, could you imagine catching like a six pound bluegill, through, especially through the ice? I mean, it, it'd peel every bit of line off your reel that you had. Um, you know, they're fun to catch, they're fun to target. Um, by far the best eating fish I think that swims uh, next to muskie but uh, you know we'll save that for a different discussion <laughs> sure it, I think for bluegills at least people up in our neck of the woods it's probably everyone's first fish so it's kind of like everybody's first love when it comes to fishing like hey this is the first one and if you see everyone's picture of when they were just a tyke and standing there with the fish it's typically with a bluegill in their hand so I think that's kind of what's interesting is we're gonna be talking about bluegill fishing today but we're talking talking about targeting the big bluegills the trophy bluegills because you know a lot of guys will be like well anybody can catch bluegills you know they're out there there's tons of them they're easy to catch but one thing that's becoming increasingly difficult to catch are big bluegills yeah you know i got a chance to film with uh linder television this last summer and hayner said it best that finding a 12 inch bluegill is harder than finding a 50 inch muskie and there's a lot of truth to that i mean I still, I mean, I've been chasing big bluegills my whole life and uh, fished all across the upper Midwest and into, you know, Nebraska and some of the places that have been notorious for growing giant fish, and I still haven't caught that 12-incher. Um, I mean, I've seen a couple, but I've never done it. 11 three quarters is my biggest, and, uh, you know, I've got multiple 50-inch plus muskies under my belt, but I don't have that 12-inch bluegill. So, yeah, finding the big ones, um, anybody can go off a, a dock and catch a bunch of you know seven eight inch bluegills i mean that's what they're there to do is to have fun catch get kids involved and um but finding those big ones i mean uh, chasing those trophies that's uh that's a passion of mine yeah they're tough to do and we've had brian brosdahl on the show and, and he's like you he loves catching bluegills and he's like i'm a guy that wants to go catch a small circular fish that's bigger than the other small circular fish. <laughs> so, pretty, pretty, pretty simple love there. You know, you're just looking for the biggest small fish in the lake. Yep. So if we're out there and we're targeting those big bluegills and we're going after the big ones, how do you get started? What do you What do you look and do when you're doing that? So it it's homework. It's a lot, a lot of homework. Uh, we're we're using. Um, you know lake maps uh, developed from you know the DNR all the the different books and studies that have been you know fight nets and um, creel studies and that of all the different sizes um, you know a lot of a uh, lot of miles you know travel a lot in the springtime um, when I go out and search you know I find kind of the lakes that I think are gonna have blue you know big bluegill populations um, by checking to see what type of weeds water clarity depth um, you know how much water coming in or out of a lake you know make sure they don't have winter freezes um, that there's fresh oxygen for those fish all, all year long and then uh, two um, a good time to see them to actually see what's up there is when the fish are on their beds every big bluegill that's in a lake is going to be up on the beds in the springtime now I won't target them but I'm usually taking my kayak or my boat and going and motoring around and you know dropping underwater cameras down and seeing the size and the quality of fish that uh, are on the beds and that tells me yep you know this lake's got potential um and there's lakes that you know what they're a ton of nine inch fish that's it you're never going to get you're never going to break that nine inch mark and then you get those special lakes that you know you'll drive around on these beds and see fish you know up shallow you know those eight and a half nine inch and you get down and you see some of these bigger beds where these big bulls are sitting over the top protecting those beds and you know they're ten and a half eleven it's like okay these are lakes I want to come back and fish this winter or you know target them late fall and, and you know get ready for a good winter season so um, it's a lot of homework just like anything else guys that deer hunt you know they got the cameras out they're putting food plots out they're putting a lot of work into growing and, and targeting those big bucks 
bluegills are the same way you know do your homework and find um what we're running into though as anglers is pressure and you know i think uh egos and that kind of getting away and um i'm not saying all all adults i think a lot of kids have uh have contributed to um you know going up to grandma and grandpa's cabin on some of these small lakes and oh yeah you know they got some big bluegills in there and they go and they don't know any better you know they haven't been educated enough yet to uh, protect the resource so they go go out every night when they're up at grandma and grandpa's cabin and catch a bunch of big 10 inch bluegills and you know cut them all up and eat them um you know it's it's hard to see but uh it's getting better you know laws are being put in place as far as regulations on um, protecting different bodies of water i was talking with uh, my caner yesterday um here at the show and the state or state of minnesota have enacted some laws some uh, i believe five fish um, limits on some of these big lakes and over the last 10 years now they've actually seen um, the size increase by almost an inch on these lakes that they've put these rules into place um, so it's working I mean we're starting to educate ourselves and they're putting a lot of effort into protecting some of these bigger fish on some of these lakes and um, I'm glad to see it and I hope it continues to get better yeah you talked a little bit about deer hunting and a lot of us like to hunt to also fish and one of the things that i've always told people is if you want to shoot 160 inch deer you got to go where there's 160 inch deer if you're hunting in an area where there's just no big deer doesn't matter how great of a hunter you are you're not going to shoot a big deer right kind of the same thing you know if you're fishing where there are no big bluegills you're not going to catch a big bluegill. And you talked a little bit about the lakes that you're seeking out. What are some of the characteristics of those lakes that, that create big bluegills? You got to have food. You have to have a good food source. Um, and with a good food source means usually good weeds, um, whether it be a coontail or a cabbage, um, something that, you know, is going to be able to protect, um, you know, the forage base and something, you know, lakes that have a lot of plankton, um, a lot of clear lakes, you know, deep, clear, um, good, tall, green weeds, uh, you know, dependent on the type of the weed, it really doesn't make a difference. But uh, those are some of the biggest characteristics that you need to have to, in order to get big bluegills. After that, you need to have a good predator source. You have to have a lake that's got um, a either good bass or a good northern pike or muskie, whatever. Um, you need a big predator fish in there to be able to eat, you know, some of the smaller, medium size and, um, you know, there has to be that balance and uh, if you don't have that balance typically when you go to a lake and you find a bunch of small panfish bluegills crappies perch whatever it may be and guys are fishing tip-ups and you know what they're catching a hammer handle pike or small bass too um, that tells me that that lake just doesn't have big fish um, there might be one or two here and there but it's not a big fish lake when we find a lake that's got big bluegills guess what we're finding 40 inch pike we're finding six eight pound largemouth uh, we're finding you know 10 pound walleyes um, when you have a lake that is fertile and grows big fish it's going to grow big fish across all species um, and you find that by again looking at you know the creel studies and surveys that these you know the DNRs put out um, and uh, you know researching and talking to bait shops and and whatnot is fi figuring out where some of these bigger fish are coming from and you know then I'll start doing my homework myself once I get out there um, things that I really like to look for um, I like lakes that have a lot of uh, cattails um, and the reason being is the cattails provide a lot of warmth in the early season and late season um, these bluegills and perch and whatnot will go up into these shallow waters and you know they're looking for food early on in the season um, you know I'm talking like early early uh, spring um, when the ice is starting to go away um, when pretty much these fish are at their you know their, their last leg of life basically can't wait for the oxygen and stuff to start replenishing um, but with cattails or you know pencil weeds or you know reeds or whatever that stick up above the ice um, those are going to be the first places that warm up and uh, transmit heat down underneath the ice and uh, start to grow bugs um, so that's one of the things that I like to look for in lakes where I chase big bluegills um, other you know other things too 
uh, river systems. You know, bluegills have a place to go in the winter time. And uh, now where I'm at over in, in Wisconsin, we've got the Wolf River. Um, and Wolf, with the Wolf River, we have a lot of down trees, a lot of timber um, that these bluegills and crappies and stuff will relate to all season long, um, feeding on on bugs and minnows and whatnot that are relating to these uh, you know different current breaks. So um, you. Know, you have to kind of do your own research and um you know what you get what you put into it yeah a lot of it's going to be boots on the ground as well yeah so so once you've kind of got your body of water picked out and you're going after big bluegills what kind of structure what kind of places are you going on that body of water to go target these guys well bluegills are just naturally um attracted to weeds at some point in the day the the bigger fish are going to be by a weed edge they're a predator to whatever they're feeding on whether it be plankton or uh, you know if they are feeding on on insects or you know even small minnows that we find some big big the big bluegills will feed on on kind of the same things walleyes do you will find the bluegills swimming right along you know with the walleyes um, I'm looking for deep weed edges on adjacent to um, the deepest basin on the lake. So wherever that, when I look at a lake map and if I find the, the deepest hole, I'm gonna look for a weed line that's closest to that spot. Um, and I like to find something that's not just a weed line, but a nice big weed flat. Because what these bluegills will do is early in the morning, when they're, you know, typical feeding windows early in the morning or just before dark, um, they'll go up and they'll cruise over the tops of these weed edges, um, or they'll, you know, be right on the edge of them, just kind of looking for food. And then uh, as the day progresses and the sun comes up, just like in the summertime, you know, typically those fish will move out over the deeper water and suspend and, uh, you know, usually conjugate them up into big schools. Um, and at that point, you know, using side imaging, um, you know, the Mega 3, 360 that's going to be coming out. I can't wait to bring that to some of these small lakes this winter and, uh, and drop that down a hole and be able to see and cover a basin, you know, with one hole versus having to drill, you know, 50 holes. So um, using electronics is a big part of finding these fish too. Um, another thing that happens that I find a lot is um, when you get into these these days where the fish are, are negative or they're real moody and they're not up so much feeding up on top of the weeds or on the edges is picture um picture walking through the woods you know in the summertime you've got a giant canopy of, of trees and leaves and then down on the bottom you've got you know just the stumps and you know the, the bases of the trees um, and everything's kind of crawling around down on those stumps um, the light isn't coming through you know you feel a little bit more safe when you're walking down on the ground and uh, you know let's say if you're a squirrel and you're down on the ground the eagles can't see through the trees so they feel safe same thing with the big bluegills they'll go down they'll go down in those stalks um, and swim down in those stalks and it's almost like they have runways or roadways that go through there that they follow um, and you have to be able to use your electronics and jigs or whatnot to get down into that stuff and uh, and fish them down there because um, they're not up above and you know they're not able to see what's going on so um, but heavy cover some some of those days is is where those fish are at and that can be a real challenge because a lot of guys when they're out there using their sonar you know the tops of the weeds and the bottom of the weeds pretty much the same thing so if you've got those fish swimming around down there a lot of times it doesn't even show up. You're right. I mean, you got you got to learn that what we call the flicker on your on your Markham. You know, we use the Markham flashers and um, learning that flicker is key to catching fish um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm still a flasher guy and I haven't you know transversed to the to the LCDs is because on an LCD um, it's nothing but just a giant blob of soundings coming back with the flasher you get that little bit of flicker that anything that's moving you can kind of still see that mm, yeah there's something down there um, and then as you start bringing your baits up through you can watch you know your marks follow you um, but uh, yeah having a, having good electronics is key and when you're out there and you're targeting these big fish, what are you using for gear? Um, you know, I one of the most important things that uh, I think gets overlooked is the fact that um, 
people fish inside the shacks, um, which is fine. I mean, uh, people get cold, whatnot. Fishing inside a, a shacks is 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 comfortable. You're going to try more things when you're comfortable. You're not cold. Um, but I fish outside a lot with really long rods, and the reason I use a longer rod, um, typically a 42 inch, um, uh, I use a, th a 13 fishing hole hopper. Um, the reason I I do that is because when I drop my baits down into the weeds, um, a lot of times um, when you're know, fishing big bluegills, remember clear water big bluegills, I'll drop my fish and my baits down into the weeds, usually a small tungsten, um, and I'll work it down inside the stalks and then just start raising it up, slowly working it up all the way through the entire water column. Now what happens more times than not is you'll start bringing your bait up and people get to the tops of the weeds and you know, that's as far as they go. But you got to remember that this water, this clear water, and just like walleyes, big fish feed, um, they're opportunists. So if the bait is underneath the ice, you know, and you're fishing down by the weeds, those fish aren't even seeing your bait. If those fish are suspended in the water column and you're fishing down in the weeds, those fish aren't seeing your bait. So you want to make sure that when you're jigging, you're covering the entire water column. Now, bluegills aren't going to chase. Um, at least not by us. They're not going to chase search baits like jigging wraps or um, you know big uh, minnow baits or anything like that. They're kind of freaked out by them. Um, so what we're doing is we're working. If I got a 42 inch rod, and my arms three feet long, I can work a seven to eight foot water column, bring you know jig my bait all the way up and then let it free fall back down. Um, but when you start bringing your bait up and you get up to the top of as however high you can reach, hold it there just for a minute and just kind of. Work Work it and you're gonna be surprised and how many fish all of a sudden boom show up and they're right there because they seen that bait from you know 50 60 feet away they seen something that they liked and bluegills love to go and investigate something if they see a little bit of a flash boom you know they swim over and they'll look at it anybody that's watched bluegills with a camera's knows they'll get right in the grill of a camera and try and figure out what's going on um so being able to have a long rod and fish that entire water column um is is really important so you're fishing tungsten with them what are you tipping the tungsten with uh i'm a live bait guy um you know if i can't catch them on live bait i very tough few times will i go back to plastics i mean if they're super finicky um you know i don't have time to sit there and spend an hour to catch one fish i want to catch the mother load of fish i want to find that school that's 100 percent active and feeding aggressively um i'm you know i'm not out for tournaments or something like that looking for that one big one um and uh, so a lot of times, you know, year larva spikes, maggots, um, wax worms, crushed up wax worms. Uh, but just like anything, um, you know, fish, uh, the colors and stuff like that is a big topic that people talk about all the time. And so many different studies are out there as far as, oh, can fish see, you know, this color of magenta versus pink or orange, you know, so many different colors are out there. But... I go back to some of the guys that the USA ice team guys have learned overseas and some of the stuff that I've studied over the years is you and the Russians and that come over to our waters, they kick our butts. I mean, they kick our tails ice fishing and they don't own a colored jig. They have silver, gold, copper, or a black nickel. Typically, that's all they have in their jig boxes. Different variations of sizes and shapes, but as far as colors go, you don't ever see any fancy colors. You know, these guys that are custom painting these baits with fine airbrushes and putting scales and all that stuff and making them, you know what? They're making fishermen spend money. They're right. collecting money. They're catching the fishermen. But is it catching the fish? I don't believe so. Um, I've fished enough with uh, different baits and that and different colors that uh, um, I always go back to either a copper um, or a gold uh, in my clear waters. Otherwise, just a straight black or that black nickel, something dark. And what you're trying to do is, um, if anybody's ever dove, and I, you know, I started diving and kind of looking at different baits under the water too, and it really opens your eyes on you know what can be seen from long distances. Um, you don't necessarily see the color. What you see is the contrast and the flash. And that I think is what's attracting these fish. So if I'm fishing a tungsten, if I got a copper tungsten on, I might have a red and a white spike on for the contrast, for the alternating colors. As you're sitting there jigging it, you get that 
that you know by color flash that's attracting the fish um, some days they don't want that some days they just want a solid color um, you know, find a lake that's got a bunch of bugs in it um, you know match the hatch as they say if there's a bunch of red worms in their bellies or you know you're finding that they're coughing up black stuff I'm gonna put all black on and just kind of match what they're eating so um, you know it's just little observations that kind of can make or break a day I think the bane of a lot of uh, pan fishermen and people that are seeking out those big bluegills you know they maybe have their camera down they see them down there and they're dropping their jigs down and those little guys are coming in there and hammering their baits what do you do about that move <laughs> you know just like what you said if you you got to fish where the big fish are and for the most part when you start running into your classes of fish um, I'm a firm believer that your classes stay with your classes uh, you might have that one stray one that comes in you know because he sees all these little guys you know going up and feeding on something he, this big guy might be off in the distance with a couple of his buddies and I've seen a ton on camera you know you'll be watching an area and you've got six inch after six inch are coming up after bait and all of a sudden off to the side you know 50 feet back or 40 feet back in this clear water you'll see this biomass of big bluegills just slowly swimming through and you might get one that'll break off that group to come over and see what these little guys are doing and then you know if you catch them you know great but most of the time they'll come they'll investigate see whatever's happening and then go back by you know the, by their buddies um, and when that happens I want to know where those buddies are going because that's where I want to be um, big bluegills stick with big bluegills that's I mean that's just what what it is do you think they get educated oh I know they get educated um, I mean the lakes that I fish by me some of these small lakes um, they get educated not so much by by baits and all that but by by noise by sound um, you know walking out on the ice um, those fish get spooked especially first ice you can tell what happens um, the first couple times we go out to some of my favorite little holes um, you know we can get out the first couple times drill holes um, the fish really aren't spooked a whole lot but by the third or fourth day out there um, the minute you step foot on the ice poof, you can see especially when if we don't have snow on the ice you can see everything just kind of like you know you like you're watching a video in the ocean when those fish just kind of like scatter yeah you can see that through the ice some days when you walk out on some of these little lakes and all of a sudden the fish might be close to the landing and then whoo, gone and it's <laughs> you know then you're screwed and you got to kind of settle down and um and you know try and pick them off but uh, i i totally agree that those fish get educated yeah you talked a little bit about it earlier, but, um, you know, I, I think that there is such a thing, and we talk about it a lot with walleyes. This is an eater walleye. This is a trophy walleye. And I think people are starting to come to terms with this is an eater bluegill, and let's throw the trophies back. What do you consider an eater bluegill, and what do you definitely is going back in the hole? It, it all comes down to what you feel like cleaning. Um... I'm not an electric knife guy. I still use a standard fillet knife and I scale all my bluegills. All my bluegills go in a tumble drum and I scale them. And what's funny is when you do a fish fry, and we've all done it, um, you've got all the you know little potato chips, you know, the two biters as we call them, and then you've got the big, you know, hand size. And typically what are the first ones that people pick off? The small ones. They taste the best, you know, the pin bones you know fry up so you don't ever taste any bones or chewing any bones. Um, so you know guys that keep the big ones, um, I don't I just never understood why keeping big fish, you know, if it if it feels that uh, you know that it feeds more people or you know you get fuller faster. I don't know, but um, the best tasting ones are definitely the small ones. Um, for me I like a seven and a half to eight and a half inch fish. That's my my bluegill that I'm going to keep and uh, throw in my scaler and um, anything typically over eight eight and a half inches. I'm putting back. Yeah, I fillet them all, but I, my family <laughs> they love the smaller fish. Yeah, you know it's just it's it's a more petite fillet, and I think just the way that they're eating them and how they like them, they like a smaller fish. So. When we're out fishing and we catch the big ones, it's just, yeah, we're throwing that one back and it's no big deal because they actually prefer to eat the smaller ones too. Yeah, and you know, it's good to take small fish out of a lake. Um, it uh, There's so many different studies that are out there now, but um, when I go to some of these lakes, if I want to go and get a meal of fish, 
I, I know where I can go and catch a bunch of seven inchers. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That's what I want to eat. I'm going to go. I have no problem killing 25 seven inch bluegills out of some of these lakes. Um, number one, there's plenty of them. Number two, um, the, the lake, that's all it, that lake has. I mean, it, you hear that ver that sound or name of stunted. Um, you know, when the lake gets stunted, they're just not going to grow big fish. Um, until you start removing some of the small ones, um, you know, it gives the, the ones that are at a certain size to start regrowing and regenerating, um, you have to get rid of some of those smaller fish. Yeah. Something about bluegill fishing that we haven't talked about that you want to touch on? Um, let's see. bluegill fishing that we haven't touched on i've kind of spilled my guts here um you know one of the things that uh that i think a lot of people overlook um two things i'm gonna i'm gonna kind of touch base on is uh you know everybody thinks when these bluegills you know stop biting or you know whenever they get finicky and they'll downsize a lot of times they'll real small um what i've learned over the years is the big bluegills especially are again opportunists and they they almost act a lot like the walleyes when the walleyes get finicky um late fall even during the winter you know what they're not eating a small bait or they're not eating what they're normally eating but if you can piss them off they're going to eat it just because they're mad so when we get these bluegills that come up and you know they inspect your bait or they come up and nose it and mouth it uh, i don't want it um but then you put on a big plastic or um you know a, a bigger bait and put like 15 spikes on it or something and drop it down there and just pound it and raise it up and down get real aggressive um they'll come over and they'll just be mad that something else is in that territory and when you're moving it fast and being aggressive you're not giving them that opportunity to inspect it they just come up and you know they bite it and you'll you'll catch them um so that's one thing i can tell guys is um if small going small doesn't work try and go big and try and go more and get fast with them and see if that triggers the bite the other thing is is that late in the season as we get into you know february um the midwinter blues and when everything typically starts going deep um goes back to what we were talking earlier about now the sun's starting to get higher right and you've got these lakes that got these really shallow bays that might have some cattails sticking up or some pencil weeds or whatever sticking up through the ice um, what's happening is that heat from that sun is transmitting down into those weeds getting underneath the ice starting to regenerate some oxygen some green um, bugs are starting to warm back up or starting to hatch um, what we find is it could be six eight inches of water underneath the ice in some of these bays you know everything else is pretty much froze out but that's where that stuff is starting to happen i find in some of these bays these bluegills can't even swim vertically you know, like they would normally they're swimming sideways you know underneath the ice like a um uh what are those fish down south flounder those flounders yeah you know they swim like flounders underneath the ice to get to those spots to find that fresh food those bugs that are starting to come up out of the weeds um and we, that's i mean it's worked for us since we've been doing that the last 10 15 years we've got a bite figured out that once that sun starts to start warms those weeds up and those bugs start going um that bite is hot for those first couple days that we figure that out um so you know experiment there again go off get away from the crowds and go uh, just drop a camera down in some really thick weeded bays once and, and see what you see and you'd be surprised a percher in there like crazy when that happens and uh, we just just murder their perch when when we find that bite so it's awesome. cool little things great advice troy we really appreciate it people want to learn more about you and want to get in contact with you how do they do it um best thing to do is uh you can find me on my website uh, mrbluegill.com otherwise uh social media facebook if you just type in mr bluegill uh, you're gonna find me you're gonna find mr bluegill troy peterson thanks for doing the show really appreciate you coming on hey thanks chris thanks for having me thanks for watching thanks for listening we'll talk to you next time